Welcome to another video, The One Good Road here. Today I wanted to walk you through a guide to hiking Pico Aneto. So Pico Aneto is the highest point in the Pyrenees, of uh, the Pyrenees mountain range, which is on the border of France and Spain. It is not, this is not the highest peak of Spain. I just want to make that clear. It's actually down in the south of Spain near Granada. Granada, there is a mountain called the Mulaten in the Sierra Nevada. Uh, it's a beautiful hike, I highly recommend it, done that myself. Um, but this Pico Aneto is actually a bit more technical, it does require a bit of scrambling, it does require uh, some micro spikes and working with snow, and we're going to get into that. So I'm going to explain to you basically everything, all the practicality to climbing this mountain. Because I found online that personally I I couldn't find a lot of people that were speaking very clearly about the route. It was usually very long-winded about um, their story, and I get that, but sometimes we just want to get straight to the point. So let's work on that. Um, I'm going to be talking about the following. Accommodation and camping in the area in the national park. The Maladetta Massive is actually in a national park. We're going to be talking about equipment and gear that you will need. Do you need crampons? Do you need micro spikes? Long story short, I did the Aneto, I summited the Aneto uh, with micro spikes and they were just fine. If you don't know the difference, the difference would be that crampons have one inch to two inch long uh, prongs or teeth um, and micro spikes are a lot more lightweight. They're usually less uh, money and they have like a silicon uh, band that wraps around your, your foot. So they're very easy to put on and off. Uh, you don't need any special shoes, just something that can withstand snow. And they have like one centimeter long teeth. Those are the difference. So yes, I, I would say you can use micro spikes. We're going to be talking the ver about the various routes. I'm going to discuss in, in brief the, the, the routes that I started off with in the area to get used to the snow, what time of year. And, and then I'll I'll leave a link down below where you can have a look at these maps on Google Maps. These are the, the red lines are marking the routes I've already hiked and what I know off by heart. And the, uh, the other colors are marking um, the, the alternative routes that you can take. So then we're going to have a look at Google Earth and Google Maps and get into those details. We're going to talk about the weather, the seasons, and safety, uh, depending on, for example, uh, if you're in winter, how much snow you're going to deal with, what's the best time of year to go up the mountain, uh, is it a relatively safe mountain to climb versus other mountains. Long story short, the 3,000 meter peaks that are in the Pyrenees, there are other ones that are easier to do than Pico Aneto. Pico Aneto has a slightly challenging section at the very end called the Paso de Malma. Um, which just literally translates to the bridge of Muhammad. And it's uh, kind of a religious thing where um, you have to cross over this, this very vertical cliff side, and it's a very narrow cret, it's a very narrow ridge. Um, and on either side, it is a bit steep. So we'll talk a little bit about that. I'll show you some pictures. Uh, I don't want to spoil it too much for you. You, you. you can feel free to skip some of the picture section, which I'll go through, uh, showing you the landscape in the area. Um, and last, lastly, I want to talk about transportation. That's kind of important on how you're going to get to the, to the mountains, how you're going to get to the Maladetta Massif. Um, so we'll begin probably with transportation. How are you going to get there? So let's load up. Um, Google Earth, and we'll have a look at the various different routes that you can take to get to this area. In this region, we have three major towns, which most people know. We have um, the town of Bayela, which is located here in the valley here. So we have Bayela, which is a skiing resort town. We have Bagna de Luchon, and then we have Benesque. Um, they're all very famous. Uh, most people know this area. So to give you a better context, we will look at a overview within Google Maps. Okay, so what we're looking at is an overview map. So for reference, the Aneto, the Pico Aneto is right kind of in the middle of the mountain range. 
uh, of the Pyrenees. To the southeast, we have Barcelona and we have Toulouse up in the north. These are the biggest towns. In my opinion, you've got two, the, the easiest way is to go to the Blagnac airport in Toulouse to arrive in the south. You can go via Barcelona, but you will need to take a long bus getting from Barcelona to the Maladetta range uh, or the Maladetta Massif. I recommend going from the French side. It's usually easier because you can fly to Toulouse. You then have a train that goes from Toulouse to Bagnères de Luchon. So you go via this way. I'm just going to draw that on the map here. This would be my recommendation. You can choose whatever you feel might be easier. So you go this way. Um, and that's where the train would go. You can also drive, rent a car, and you can hitchhike. In my experience, hitchhiking in France is easier than Spain, maybe because of in Spain they have they had the Franco time and the dictatorship, and that might, in my opinion, that has made some impact on to the hitchhiking in Spain. Um, for example, I, I was trying to get a lift uh, to Bayela through the tunnel here. And uh, it was quite difficult finding a person because the, the, the Spaniards are very cautious to doing hitchhiking. The people who did give me a lift were extremely kind and very friendly. Um, you will need to pick up some of the vocabulary. For example, uh, asking like, where are you going is a donde vas, that's in Spanish. And then when it comes to uh, France and the French side, you want to probably stick with something simple like, où allez-vous? Um, and these, these vocabulary, these phrases will be very useful in order to communicate with locals because yes, English is very well spoken, but at the same time, if you're down in the towns, not as much. Up in the high mountains, there's, there's definitely a, a good amount of English spoken, um, but down in the valleys, there's a lot of just the native tongue, so the native language, and I highly recommend studying a little bit of the vocabulary and a few phrases. Um, so that's transport. That's how you're going to probably get there. And those are my hitchhiking recommendations. Um, on the map, as we can see, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven different locations that you can park your vehicle and you can start from here or you can either hitchhike to these points. The first point on the map would be Col de Portillon, which is right on the border between Spain and France. Um, I'll show you some of the pictures later. Um, the next point you can start from is Hospice, Hospice de France, which is, I believe, is down here. Yeah, Hospice de France. Um, again, you can look at these maps yourself and get a feel for them. And this goes to Port de Benesque. Benesque is pronounced with a v, a, a b, not a v. Um, it's a Benesque, uh, depending on which pronunciation, French or, or Spanish, you want to use. Um, then we've also got down here another car park, which is possible, and that's La Bersuta. My Spanish is not as familiar. I apologize for any uh, mispronunciations. We also have the refuge de la Ronclusa. Ronclusa. I'm using French uh, pronunciation, sorry. Um, and these are the different routes that you can choose to go from. We also have over here in the south, we have the route which goes to the, rev, uh, the reservoir of Yauset, um, which is starting from Eneto down in the, in the south here. Um, we also have another one which starts just on the main road on the N230. There's no name for these areas. This is just on the frontier between Catalonia and Aragon. Um, so you have two par car parks there and there is a bus stop actually just here, which is right next to the tunnel of Bayela. So you have those two options to start. And then finally, we have, um, actually, there's, no, sorry, there's two more, actually. Um, we have the, the refuge de Cronas, which is over here. Um, and then over, again, northwest of that, we have um, uh, refuge de la Artiga de Lin. Pardonnez-moi, je, je connais français mieux que mon espagnol. Um, okay, so these are the different routes. These are the different starting points. Again, here, here. These are places that you can park your car and you can have a look at these in detail if you wish. We are going to switch to another map to, which will give you a better sense of the, of the terrain in the area because right now what I'm looking at is just purely transport getting to these locations which most people use Google. Okay, so this is, this is pretty much where you can start. You can research this in your free time and all of the red routes I've already walked again 
and uh, I know them off by heart, and all of the other colored routes that you see on the map, um, I, I actually haven't walked through those. So just take that with a grain of salt. Um, I, the first thing that I did in the area, which I, I explored the, the French side and the, uh, the south side in Spain of the Maladeta range, and I wanted to get a feel for the snow. So let's have a look at Google Earth. Google Earth is going to give us a better sense of the terrain that you'll be up against uh, and what kind of uh, routes that you can take uh, and what kind of shortcut. You can see this on the map very, very clearly. Um, the first route I did was down in the south here going up to the res reservoir. Um, it's a do doable location to start from. There's a tunnel here. It's lovely scenery. Um, this is an option. Um, another option is down on the border of the frontier of Catalonia and Aragon, like I said. Bus stops over there. Uh, here, going to the refuge to Cronas, which is near Benesque, you will need to use a car to get here. But this road in this valley here is uh, all gravel. Uh, you will need to keep that in mind if you want to drive with a 4x4, but you can use a standard car. You don't need a 4x4 for that route. Um, and over in, if you want to start from the French side, you can start from Hospice de, uh, de, de France. Um, so we have these two lakes here. There's another route, I'm just going to mark that very briefly. There's another route coming up this way, which goes around, and you can see the other lakes on the other side of this ridge. You can research that in your own time. Best maps that you should carry with you, paper maps, I recommend carrying them, would be IGN and Alpina. I think it's called Alpine or Alpina, uh, and that's in, in Spain, and RGN is for France, and they're pretty good, high detailed maps of the region. Recommend definitely carrying some. Um, the reason I didn't go up this, this uh, alternative path was because this was covered in ice at that time, and there's a cascade coming down this way, um, and it was trickier this way. Um, Fun fact though, the, the Maladetta was where the ridge, the whole mountain range got its name. Maladetta Massive kind of means damned or cursed mountains in Spanish. Uh, well, in English, I mean. Um, and uh, you, there's a lot of history to this area, a lot of history. Um, the Port de Menesque is a very historical route, dating back to probably like the 15th or 16th century. Um, it's really incredible, the history. You will read that on the panels in the area. Um, let's talk about the time of year. Um, the best time of year would probably be, be between the months of May to about September, because there's not a lot of snow. Um, the best side to climb from the mountain up to the Pico Aneto um, is, is from the south side, because that gets more sun than the north side. Another fun fact is that the Maladetta was, was like I said, that's how it got its name. And the peak down in the valley, the perspective looks like the Maladetta peak is higher than the Aneto. But then with time and over many years and GPS, they realized that the Aneto was 50 meters higher. So that's a strange fact. Pretty much all of the Maladetta and the glaciers here, they sit around 3,000 meters and above that. Um, the, the Kronos lakes and these lakes here are absolutely stunning. I highly recommend them. Um, so yeah, the best times of year is summer. Uh, if you want to go in winter, you will deal with minus 15, probably maximum minus 20 at night um, on a really cold, windy day. Um, so you definitely want to be seriously prepared for winter. Um, that being said, it's very doable on a nice, clear, sunny day. Uh, I went twice in this region in October and then another time in February. Um, and I'll show you the pictures of the area in a minute. And I found that it was very, very doable. I think it was actually, uh, it was nice having the contrast of a bit of snow and a bit of uh, clear sun warming up the, the, the lower valley. Uh, I loved that. I thought it was really beautiful. So the way this works is that in 2020, I did these two first sides on the south and the north side here. And I, I found that for me, I was trying to look for a route where I could connect where I'd already been because I've already hiked the Pyrenees in total. You can have a look at my, my full video on that if you're interested. And I went through this valley, going through Bagna de Luchon and then back down to, to Bosot uh, in Spain. And I wanted to connect what I had already done uh, to the area. It's just a nice, nice thing to do. 
Um, and I recommend this route, actually. You start at a higher elevation at, Port de, um, at Col de Port de Lyon. Um, and uh, there is a, a, a decent way going up. You start at 1300 meters. So it's quite high in elevation. Um, all of them are roughly, you have other routes which start 1500 meters. Okay, so we've got different routes uh, which I'm showing on the map and different altitudes that you start at. This is around 1500 meters here for reference. Um, this one is around 1900 meters. And over here, you probably start at 1,000 meters, roughly, over here um, in this area in France, okay? So these are the different altitudes that you'll be dealing with, um, and you'll need to pick what suits you best. Uh, the, the Pico Aneto is done best with two days of hiking. The most typical routes would be going from the car park here or at uh, Refuge de Cronos. In my opinion, from my experience, I would say that the best route would be on the south side of the mountain, going up from 1900 meters and climbing up this way. There's less snow, the glacier time is less. Um, the, the, the section that's most commonly marked on the map is to go uh, on this orange route here, which is very difficult uh, on the coal, actually, the, the pass is difficult. Um, it's very narrow, very sheer. Um, and if you're wanting to start from this side, it's also doable to go something like this, you see? Um, I'm going to zoom in on that. So you can, you can start from the car park down here. This road is closed in winter, uh, going from about roughly here. This section of the road, I believe, is closed. So you'll need to take a taxi to get there. Um, but in, I can confirm in October, it is open. Um, again, you'll need to research that. Uh, on, on some of the websites. By the way, the park that you will be walking in is roughly this area, like this, okay? This is roughly the park, meaning that there is restrictions on camping um, and there's a deeper respect for the nature. Um, that being said, they have built like these giant refuges like down in the, by uh, Atangdu, uh, um, the lake here at uh, Yosa, Yaset. There is a giant uh, refuge here, which is very large, and it's like a hostel. It's like a mount, uh, like a mountain hotel. It's very strange, actually. Practical, but you know. Um, so, the most common routes are to start the Aneto from the south side, and you can start from the north side. But I would highly recommend going around like this. Uh, you have uh, Refuge de Cronas here, which is a really good spot to start. Um, and then you also have uh, Refuge de Ren, Renculsa, Renculsa uh, down here, uh, which is also highly doable. Very expensive though, keep that in mind. Mountain huts here are pricey. Um, I believe I asked for, you know, how much does it cost to stay here? He said it was 50 euros for the night and you had to have the breakfast included, which was another 50 euros. That's 100 euros. And I, I arrived very late when I got there and he said, you know, you can just sleep on the other side of the river if you want. So I just, I just slept there and it was fine. Um, and then the next day he, rec he recommended me to climb over the pass and I followed this red line here. Met some fantastic people. It's a very international route. Um, it's very beautiful. And now let's have a look at some of the pictures so that you get an idea of the terrain. I won't spoil it too much for you. There are just two crucial sections on the top of the mountain, uh, which are located here and here, like I said, Paso de Malma, and there's another section. The rest of it is all very, very doable. Um, what we're gonna do though, before we do that, is I'm gonna twist it round, and we're gonna look at some of the terrain if you were starting from the French side. I'm gonna tilt the camera a little bit. So I'm just gonna pan through so that you can have a look at this. Um, again, you can load Google Earth on your device and have a look at this yourself. Um, it works on the web browser as well. Um, and that gives you an idea of the terrain, okay? We've got the glaciers here, which are rapidly shrinking. I'm going to show you some of the photos of that. Um, the Kronos Lakes, we've got the refuge down here in the valley. Uh, the, then I decided to climb on the GR11 here, which is the red line. Um, and, uh, and then I went on to go and finish down in the valley to do the hitchhiking back out of the valley. Um, yeah, so that's the route. Um, and that's where I have been so far. 
So let's have a look at some of the pictures and what kind of terrain that you will be working with. The first trip that I did was starting from the Aneto side, like I showed you on the map. Um, this was in the month of February, so this gives you an idea that there's not a lot of snow sometimes. Um, but then once you get to about 2,000 meters, there's plenty of snow. Uh, this is the barrage. Uh, this is the Atang or the reservoir, Yauset. Uh, it's very large and this gives you an idea of snow. We then realized that we needed to use micro spikes to go any higher than 2,000 meters. That's definitely what we noticed. And feel free to pause the video at any moment and you can have a look at these maps. Um, it's very well signposted in the area. It's a very lovely, beautiful area actually. Um, and the other times I've gone is in October. So this is really the height of the snow. It doesn't really get more than that, I would say. Um, but yeah, we've had, it's definitely getting warmer each year. Uh, this is one of the tunnels. These are the kind of roads that you might be driving on just to give you an idea. So you can see that the roads are a little rough, but they're not too bad. You can definitely get up without a four by four, for sure. Um, a lot of history in these mountains as well. So this one is actually starting from Hospice de France. So this is on the French side. Again, you can have a look at the map in detail. Um, this is uh, on, the, on the north side of the mountain, and this is climbing up to Port de Benesque. So you can see that it's a, it's, this was quite snowy. The time we went in this was 2020, and it was in October, I believe. Um, plenty of snow that just arrived. Uh, we wanted to test out the micro spikes to get used to the terrain. Uh, the lakes are gorgeous. I actually like walking in the snow, but it's just difficult to camp there during the night because it can get pretty cold. Um, those are some things you might want to consider. Uh, this is Port de Benesque. This is the top. So you have the Maladetta, which is located here on the screen. And then you have the Pico de Neto or the Tuca de Neto, um, which is on the left. You can see the perspective. You can see why historically the Maladetta looks taller. Um, because of the perspective. And like I said, that, that, that refuge is down here, the refuge de Renculsa, um, and it climb, and you climb basically up down from there, and you climb over this ridge here, and then there's a, there's a glacier, the glacier here, and you climb up like this, if that makes sense. Okay. And I'll, you can just feel free to stop the, the video at any moment and, and get a feel for this. These, these are the micro spikes silicon bands and these one centimeter teeth. They're only 30 euros from Decathlon and they worked absolutely fine. Uh, you, I don't think you need crampons in this area. That's my opinion. It will depend on the route that you take. So if you follow the routes I've done, I can say to you that micro spikes work, but at the same time, do this at your own risk, at your own cautious, caution. Um, I'm just trying to give you as much information as you can to be b as best prepared as you can of hiking in this area. Um, a lot of the forests are, pre are preserved in that area because they were never done, there was never any agri agriculture done in the area. Um, the forests on the French side are mostly gone because agriculture and, and farming was, is, was done more historically on this side. There we go, we've got Espana and Col de Porte de Lyon. Um, and it's a very nice cycling route actually. Um, this is the, the coal I was mentioning before. Again, it's very well mapped. It's really, it's, it's pretty well uh, marked as well uh, in the area. Uh, so you, you, as long as you take a paper map and you use uh, these two applications, I recommend uh, Open, uh, what is it called? O, OSM and Plus, which is an application I have a review on. You can have a look at that. I'll leave an iCard or something in the description. And the other one is mappy.cz. This is the Maladetta, also probably a pretty good hike. Over here in, in, the, in the, just in this section here, there is a, the, this is the Col, the Col de, or the, sorry, the pass, the pass of, uh, the pass de Cronas. And basically once you get on the glacier, which is really small right now, you basically climb through that crevice here, which is very easy to, it's not very well marked because there's no, it's, it's not marked, but you definitely can feel the, the, the way basically. Um, as long as you follow that crevice there. Uh, I recommend using a GPS unit like a phone. Uh, and then once you get onto the snow line here, you basically go around and then you climb over here. Again, there's a tricky section right there. 
Uh, if you're climbing from the other side of the mountain range, on the south side, you will still need to climb over this section. Other people do climb up right on the ridge here. It is not recommended to do that. I would highly recommend to go around the peak here. It's much safer. And then there's a slight section like I've marked right here that's a little bit tricky. Um, after that, you then climb fairly easily up to the, the first peak of the Aneto. And then there's kind of like a twin peak. They're twin peaks, and you've got to go through the Paso de Malma. Um, the Paso de Malma is optional. You, you can, if you feel like you're not confident enough to do the scrambling that's required, um, this is a nice map show. You know, all the peaks on the massive, uh, you can on, on the range. Uh, you can you can pause and have a look at that. This is uh, the glacier that was in 1997. This is what it looked like. That so get that burned in your mind. That's what it looked like. And this is what it looks like today. So you can see that the glaciers have really shrunk. This part is where that photo was taken. All the glacier is almost gone. Um, so if you get to walk on it in the next 20 years or 10 years, you're lucky because I think it's melting pretty fast. Um, it's absolutely mind, mind blowing. Um, so yeah, uh, these are the different camping. Let's talk a little bit about camping. Uh, when it comes to camping, you need to be pitching up your tent uh, it's tolerated to pit up, pitch up your tent after sunrise. Um, um, sorry, yeah, after sunset and before sunrise, it's tolerated to put your your uh, your tent down. They recommend putting. Uh, it's tolerated between the altitudes of two thousand one hundred and two thousand five hundred meters. Again, that kind of depends on where you are in the Pyrenees, but that's generally the case that I found on either side of the border. In the, in the park, they actually try to prohibit it. Um, but then again, sometimes if you're caught in a, in a bad weather situation, uh, you, you, need to, uh, you need to work with the weather you've got. Um, so those are my, my advices. And if you're doing bivouac, which is actually to like do the bivy tenting, I think it's more tolerated than using big tents. Um, but then, then again, keep that in mind. Uh, it's, it's better to camp higher. Uh, they do recommend you to stay at the refuges, but this one was 100 euros, uh, 50 euros without food. So, and the other refuges I found in the area were about the same price. Uh, they're all similar. Um, so this gives you an idea of, this is uh, La Refuge de Rencoulas, I think it's called. I'm pronouncing it the French way, sorry. Um, and, uh, and yeah, here it is. It's, it's got a lot of history to it. I like this refuge because of the, the stone feel. It's got a lot of charm to it. I like that. Um, the other refuge that I found is like, it was this giant metal box, which is like insanely large. Um, so this is the kind of, this is where the glacier used to sit, climbing up to Aneto. This is the Maladetta ridge on the top here. And this is the kind of terrain you'll need to navigate. It's not that difficult. Um, it's just that you'll, you'll need to have a good sense of direction. That's the main thing. Uh, again, you follow this ridge, uh, which is like really deep. It's like a cut in the, in, in the mountain itself. You kind of roughly use that as a, as a marker to follow. Um, this is the kind of snow. This is, this is in October. I use salopets and micro spikes and they work absolutely fine. Um, this gives you an idea. This is on the glacier looking down. Uh, this was the little section I was talking to you about, which is a little bit tricky. Uh, it's just, it's about like a two meter like vertical up climb and you need to scramble up over this. It's not that difficult, but with a heavy backpack, it could be. Um, so you need to have some, some scrambling experience. I recommend doing this over the weekend where there's more people going. That way you're around other people. Uh, I did this alone and I was very grateful to have other people around me. This is the very famous Paso de Malma. So to get to the very top, you need to climb over this part. And to give you a better sense of where that ridge line is, it's right there. You can see that's pretty narrow and it's pretty sheer on both sides. It's a 50 to, it's probably 100 to 100 meter, 100 to 200 meter drop. Um, so it's recommended to use ropes um, to, to tie onto each other. I didn't do that personally. Uh, as long as you've got your wits about you, you're confident, uh, you don't pick a windy day, you pick a clear day, uh, no rain, as much grip as you can get. I even took my crampons and my backpack off for this section and I left it on this side of the peak. Um, and be patient with everybody, don't, don't rush anybody. 
um, you, you're going single file and you will eventually get up to here, which is where the, the cross is located. Very lovely people, very international. Everybody on the mountain speaks English pretty much. And uh, even if it's broken English, you can still speak English, but uh, it's very good to know Spanish if you're there, obviously. Uh, and French is less, was less useful in that area, but I did meet a lot of international people for sure. Uh, that's uh, the Lake de Cronos. This is the south side of the Maladetta range, a lot less snow. This is the peak itself. There's a cross. This was put up here in 1951. This is the, the point where you reach 3,400 meters, highest point of the Pyrenees. Um, absolutely stunning, very beautiful weather. Um, and this is down back, heading back down. This is, this is on the glacier, which again is really small today. It's, it's shrinking. Um, and I decided to go south. So I did this over the course of four days, climbed 3,800 meters. Um, I was very confident with the area because I, I studied it uh, before going out there. This is on the south side looking up. You've got Pico Eneto here, and then you've got the Col, which is over here, Col de Cronas. I mean pass, sorry, that's the French way of saying it. Pa the pass of Cronas. And you climb down like this, basically. So hopefully that's useful. Uh, this is the, the lake of Kronos, which is very beautiful. Uh, and then you eventually get down to the refuge if you want to stay there, or you can start from here. Uh, it's a very good point to start. Please treat this refuge with, with, uh, with, with care. I feel like it needs a bit of TLC, a bit of tender loving care. Um, it's, everybody is using it. It's a public space. Please treat it with, 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 with care uh, when you're staying here. Uh, very friendly people. I've met some fantastic people here. Uh, I was able to even practice a little bit of my Spanish and they were practicing a lot of their English, which was great. Maps, get some paper maps. These were the Alp Alpine, Alpine maps. Very, very high detail, really, really good. Again, the GR11 is really well mapped. This is the uh, refuge to Yauset. Um, it's massive, it's big, it's really in your face kind of thing. Um, it's practical, it costs 2.5 million euros to build this thing. Um, uh, I'm grateful for the convenience and for the cleanliness. I found that the, the guards there were not so accueillant, meaning um, uh, they weren't so friendly, I would say. It was, it was kind of a strange thing. Um, and, uh, so, and it's also very high prices, so keep that in mind. But remember, it's respect that it's a business. Um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not going to cost 10 euros to have a pizza. It's going to cost 16 euros. Uh, for example, I had a Coke uh, and then a half a sandwich, which looked like this, with cheese, because I'm vegetarian. Um, and I had like a packet of biscuits, and that was 13.50. So just keep that in mind is that you should really bring enough food for you when you're around there. Uh, the water was free and was really good. Again, this is the GR11, uh, and that's the, what the building looks like. It's actually two different sections. Um, you can think whatever you want to think of it, basically. It's, it's still a hostel, it's still a practical. I love these little refuges. I think they're so quaint. I'll let you try and figure out where that is on your own. I think it's, it was very charming. I, was, I slept alone in there. There was nobody there when I went there. Um, and it was so, so peaceful in that area. It was just lovely. Um, again, this is back down onto the N230. I don't know the name of this road. It's just like the N230. Um, and uh, again, hitchhiking was a bit long to get out of the area. Um, so that was my route. And you can, hopefully this information is useful to you. Um, you can see that they do say that bivouac is sort of like antaldi, it's kind of forbidden. Um, so you want to keep that in mind. Again, it's more tolerated at a certain hour of the day. And it's more tolerated when you are in a very remote space. Also respect the nature. Don't leave your trash behind, please. Um, uh, take it with you um, and, uh, you know, respect other people who are around there. Don't damage the paths and things like this. Just wanted to go over some applications that you can use for weather, looking up the weather in that area of the Aneto, of the Maladetta range. You can either use Google Met Weather, where you literally just go on Google and you type in weather and the name of the town. Look up the towns of Banesk, Bayela, and Luchon. Those towns, uh, Bagnères de Luchon, those towns will all give you 
the weather and it's fairly accurate. I found that Google weather is pretty good for that area to get to get like a, a general sense. You, you basically want to go onto your uh, 10 day window, um, which will load up here. And you want to look for a two day weather gap where it's clear. So for example, you can see here that this is not actually ideal weather conditions. There's, there is a really good day on the 18th here. For example, you could arrive there, it's raining, you, you hike up to the refuge, and then the next day it's clear. So that's kind of what you want to look for is two days of fairly good weather and make sure that you get up to the Paso de Malma with no wind and clear skies. Another application, if you want to really get in depth with this, is that you can use Windy Maps, Windy TV. The, the, um, they, they keep changing their name, but you can have a look. Uh, it's, on, it's on the Google Play Store. It's also a website. Um, and you, you click on the cloud section and uh, you can look at the clouds that will be over that region. I highly recommend this. This will tell you uh, not only just clouds, but it'll also tell you temperature in that area. So definitely have a look at this application. It'll give you lots of insight into that region. Um, like I said, you can load up temperature. That will give you a very good idea of what it will be like at night. So let's go over to night. Now you can see the temperature is dropping over the night and it says it's roughly going to be about nine degrees during the night. So that, that's just some ideas. Uh, you, you feel free to use whatever, whatever weather applications you use. Um, I do recommend using Google as a rough guide and then using windy.com to actually get like much better uh, weather predictions and predicting the, the temperature. I also want to mention if you are interested in having a private guided experience or a guided tour experience, just send me a message at my email or on my Instagram, uh, the one good road at gmail.com. Uh, that's my email. So just, yeah, if you're interested in a, in a guided experience in the Pyrenees, just let me know. So let's just summarize. Um... During the months of May and September are the warmest times of year and the easiest times of years to go. Uh, definitely take enough layers with you because it can be cold. Uh, can you use micro spikes? Yes. Do you need crampons? Not necessarily. That's my experience, but do that at your own risk. Um, I found it was fine for me. Uh, accommodation, you can either stay in the refuges and not carry anything. I would not recommend that. I'd still recommend you to carry a tent just in case. Um, we already talked about micro spikes and crampons. Roots, take a paper paper, take a paper map with you, definitely. Uh, and also you can download these KML and GPX files and put them on your devices. You can put them on Garmin's, you can put them on your telephone. I already gave you some ideas for the applications you can use. You can use Google, but it won't be offline. You need to make sure it's offline before you do that. Um, and then we already talked about weather and safety uh, seasons. Um, if you have any other questions about how to do this, how you might want to do this, um, leave them down below. Um, and that's pretty much it. I hope you found this useful. Um, I've tried to make it as much information as to share it as exact as I can. Uh, I don't, I don't want to bore you guys with that information. I want it to be clear and practical information for you. I hope that's useful. Um, leave your thoughts below. Uh, subscribe. Uh, if you like these kind of styles of videos, I might make some new ones in the future, um, talking about other mountains in the area. Have a look at those documentaries of hiking in the Pyrenees. Uh, lots of good, good information there for you. And that's about it. Thanks for, thanks for watching.